Are you tired of battling crowds every time you go to some really cool hiking destination anywhere in the world? Well, today I've got a special treat for you. I brought back previous guests Richard and Susan, but this time they're going to be telling us about an amazing hiking adventure on the North Island of Japan. Most of us don't even know anything about it, so we're going to be learning about that today and finding a wonderful new place for us to go explore away from the hustle and bustle of all the crowds going to all the most popular places in the world these days. So let's get started. Welcome to the Active Travel Adventures podcast. I'm your host, Kim Parks, and today we're bringing back some of my favorite guests, Susan Bricky and Richard Pope, who we first met when they told us about their Bolivia and Peru adventure. And they recently went to Japan to hike in the northernmost island called, I'm gonna say this wrong, Hokkaido. I love the fact that this is not an over-tourist area because it's becoming a huge issue. So it's nice to be able to go someplace that's gorgeous. The food's good, the lodging is great, the little amenities are great, but you're not jammed with all these people. So let's talk, let's back up a little bit. Japan itself is comprised of about 7,000 islands and is over about 3,000 kilometers or almost 2,000 miles long from top to bottom. But of all those 7,000 islands, there's five main islands. And today we're gonna to be exploring the northernmost island called Hokkaido. About three quarters of Japan is forested, it's mountainous, it's unsuitable for agricultural or industrial or even residential use. Which of course, that makes it perfect for us hikers because that means there's lots of places we can hike that are just not good for buildings. And because of this irregular landscape, most of the people are crowded into the few suitable areas, mostly by the coastlines. For example, Greater Tokyo is now the most densely populated city in the world with over 37 million people. And as Richard will explain, the island we're visiting today, Hokkaido, has about 20% of the land mass, but only 5% of the population lives there. So there's lots of space to breathe and enjoy the beautiful landscapes. So without further ado, here's my interview with Susan Brickley and Richard Pope. I'm delighted to have Susan and Richard back on the program, but before we get started, let's get a little backstory. Uh, why is it that you folks choose adventure travel to start with? Why not just do the regular cultural tours like most people? I think we just love being active and we don't want to waste any time not being active while we're still able to do so. Definitely. And you've been all over the world. What made you choose this trip in particular? I think this one is my fault completely, but uh, I think Sue enjoyed it just as well. I've never been to Asia anywhere, and I always thought Japan was appealing, and I, I just like the culture, the, the politeness of the people. But I'm also, like to say, we love adventure travel, and I was looking for an outlet that would allow us to do some hiking. And local company Mountain Hiking Holidays offers a trip to Hokkaido only once every few years. And it came up this year and we jumped on it because it looked like exactly what I wanted, a combination of some culture with a chance to hike, do some challenging hikes in the northern part of Japan. Explain to us a little bit about exactly where this is in Japan. I was looking online, tell everybody exactly kind of where this is. You fly into Tokyo, I assume, and then what do you do from that and how do you get to where you're starting? Okay, yeah, so Hokkaido is uh, the northernmost island of Japan. It's separate, of course, from the rest of the main part of Japan, and it's about an hour and a half flight from Tokyo to Sapporo, which is their main airport. So it's just a matter of, of a transfer. And then the interesting thing about Hokkaido, I mean, Japan is a very crowded country. Hokkaido has 20% of its area and only 5% of its population. So that was also appealing. I mean, we love to meet the Japanese, but maybe not in such crowded situations as subways and <laughs> crowded cities. So this was the ideal combination for us. Yeah, that's true. And when you counter about Tokyo, greater Tokyo is the largest city in the world too. So it's such a counterpoint to that. Exactly. And we never actually saw Tokyo. We had to sign up for this, our flights kind of in a rush because of the timing. And we just gotten back from another big trip and, and we thought, well, Tokyo could more in a separate trip if we want to. So all we saw was the Narita Airport, which is really not even in town. So we just sort of landed a few hours later. We're right off again onto into Sapporo. You mentioned time. How about the timing? When's a good time of year to do this trip? I think it's their climate is similar to ours in Northwest United States here. So 
September is often a good time. You avoid thunderstorms and you avoid the winter. One thing that did surprise me about Hokkaido, even though it's the same latitude as basically Portland, where we are, a lot of their weather is influenced by Russia and Siberia. So they got much colder winters. It will snow there when it never snows here. So doing it in the winter was not an option. The summer just seemed to be a bit more crowded. So they happened to schedule their trip in September. I think that was probably one of the ideal months to go. Were you able to see fall colors? Yes, I think it was true that we saw fall colors, particularly when we were hiking high on the volcanoes. Cool. And so let's talk a little bit about the landscape. What exactly are you seeing when you're over there? I know that they're part of the ring of fire. Are you involved with volcanoes or regular mountains or what are we looking at there? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I think nearly every hike we did was either on a volcano or in a geothermal area. It's much more active than we are, even though we're in Oregon, we're actually part of the ring of fire as well, but we're pretty dormant over here. In Japan, we found it to be quite active. There were a lot of steaming vents and bubbling mud pots, steaming volcanoes. They're being monitored and none of them were ever closed when we were there, but they do keep an eye on it. So it's something to bear in mind that there's always a risk there could be an eruption over there when you're, when you're in the area. Right. I remember even in Nicaragua, too, seeing all the, I guess it's the seismic meters or monitors or whatever it was, but they had a, a feel for it. Considering what happened in New Zealand this past week, it's become particularly important to make sure that the countries are on top of that. and do Because you do get some advance warning that there's increased activity. Oh, absolutely. So describe the landscape to us. What did you see? It's very green like it is here. They get a fair amount of rainfall throughout the year. So there's actually valleys that are flat, which are almost all used for agriculture. We saw lots of rice and other crops being grown. And then the mountains are fairly steep. Again, some of them look like very rugged, recent volcanoes. Others are maybe older, more rounded peaks. But there's one even they call Fujikan. It resembles Mount Fuji. It's sort of the Hokkaido's version of it. So there are very some symmetrical cone-shaped peaks, kind of a combination of the raw volcanic and a lot of dark green leafy leaf, uh, you know, roadsides, things like that. Nice. And so you were with a group. Tell us a little bit about your group. There were only six of us, which was quite nice. It was a nice size. One of the owners of the company, Mountain Hiking Holidays, John Hosaki, was one of our guides. And then they had a local guide we were well served because we were a little different in pace. And so Tom, our local guide, took four of us in the front, and then John stayed with the other two. Everyone was close to 60 or over. They were strong hikers. Even the people that were a little slower were very strong. They were all American, although two were Asian American. Two women we traveled with were from New York City. And we just really enjoyed each other and enjoyed the countryside and enjoyed hiking. At some point is to say that there were lots of Japanese hiking. None of these trails were crowded, but the Japanese hikers I thought were quite stylish and very colorful and very friendly. Nice. So you did get to have some local interaction. I love that. And so I saw on their website too, they they offer, let's say somebody's not a strong hiker, sometimes you had options each day too. So if one day was particularly hard, you might have a softer option. So anybody experiencing that or can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. In most of those cases, you don't actually do a different hike. You just do a shorter version of the hike that the other group does. So you will probably all start out together. And then there's places where you might be able to loop back or, or take a slightly shorter route or just don't, if this is out and back, you might do a shorter out and a shorter back. So they did a very nice job at accommodating people who didn't want to hike quite as far. But we've never totally separated like on different hikes. And we all did the longer hikes except for the last day, which was a 10-mile hike and 4,500 feet elevation gain. And the decision not to do that one was primarily because it was socked in. <laughs> it was all overcast. And even if we had done it, we wouldn't have been able to see anything. And we did an alternative hike, the whole group of us, that we all just really enjoyed. Nice. And so if you were to rate it on a difficulty scale of one to five, five being like super, super brutal and challenging, we're not talking Everest, but the hardest hikes that you can think of doing that you would personally do, where would you put this if you chose the softer day versus the harder day? Like what would the range be? Yeah, I think the easier days would be like two, kind of a level high, two or three, and a harder days, three to four. 
One of the things that surprised me about the hiking a little bit was, I mean, obviously we'd seen some photos on their website from mountain hiking holidays. They show what you'd expect, you know, the beautiful scenery, the big volcanoes and beautiful trails. But what we found is that the trails were more challenging in terms of being steep and rough than we kind of expected. We probably thought we'd get a little more nicely graded trails. So while the hiking wasn't super difficult, the trails were probably just the footing was more challenging. The terrain was either rocky or a lot of tree roots. They don't groom their trails or else they get overused a lot. We're not quite sure the reasoning, but you know, some of the trail maintenance was a little behind, but it was still really, really fun. It just a little more challenging. You had to watch your foot footing a little bit more than, than usual. Well, that's important information to know. Is it something you would recommend bringing hiking sticks? Absolutely. Yes, we all used hiking sticks, I, I believe. Because of the unsureness of the footing, it really helps. And then some of the steps are tall. Even though the Japanese people tend to be smaller than us, there were some pretty tall steps in there. And having the poles help you get up those steps. Yeah, I like them going downhill too a lot too. They seem to take some pressure off my knees. Let's talk about the trail markings. Is this something, you went to several national parks, we'll talk about that in a minute. But are the trails well marked that if somebody were doing this by themselves, they would feel comfortable? Or did you feel more comfortable with the fact that you had guides with you? Well, it was always nice to have guides. I think the trails were pretty self-explanatory. Most of the signs, injunctions were pretty clearly marked, and the trailheads were well marked. The highly touristed areas have dual language. There are some places that are more remote where you only see the Japanese characters, and that might require a little bit of interpretation. For the most part, I think you could do some of these hikes on your own. All right. And then let's talk about, too, you, you stayed in some pretty cool places. Why don't you tell us about that? Well, almost every place we stayed was an onsen, which ha- means that there were those hot community baths. And that was quite an experience. We had written directions that we were provided by our travel company that we read thoroughly. And then John went over it with us. He said, you're going to be tempted if you see an Asian person to do what they do. But in fact, some of those Asian people are Thai or Chinese, and they don't know. So please read the directions. So they are divided where we stayed. They were divided into men's sections and women's sections. And very often, one section would be on the high floors, like the eighth floor with a view, and the other one would be on the first floor. They were totally lovely, always warm, always clean. In your room, when you arrived, you would find clothes that you could wear. So you could get out of your hiking clothes, into your onsen clothes, and go. Of course, you're bathing totally nude, but you totally shampoo and soap and clean yourself before you get in the tubs. You never put anything with soap or any kind of wash rag into the baths because you've already really cleaned yourself beforehand and it's poor etiquette to to get your wash rag in the water. There were all sorts of pools. Some of them were just soaking pools. Some had bubbles. Some were rain coming down from the top of you. And then at two o'clock in the morning, they closed these and reversed them. So if you were a woman on the first floor one day, uh, the next day, you could be on the eighth floor with the view. And some of the pools were outside. And then you could wear your onsen clothes to dinner, which was really wonderful when you were tired from a good long hike. You came in, you took your bath, you went to dinner. I have to tell you, the food there was outstanding. We mostly had buffets, but If people are wondering what the food is like, it was really, really good. And it wasn't all sushi. (laughs) In fact, a small section of it was sushi. So that was a really wonderful part of the trip, even for active people, or particularly for active people. Yeah, that reminds me of, I interviewed Sherry from Ots World in episode number 54, when she did the Kamanakoto Trail in Japan. And the same thing about she loved the bath and loved the food. And of course, the landscape was stunning. Let's talk a little bit about what you actually did. And in fact, one of the photos, it actually reminded me, as I think you mentioned too in an email, the Tongarino Crossing in New Zealand. Right. It's it's pretty rugged landscape. We did visit four national parks, and they were the largest national parks in Hokkaido. There are just a couple of really small ones we did, did not visit. The national parks there are a little smaller than some of the, say, the typical American national park. Everything's just scaled down a bit, but 
they're still very pristine and isolated. There's no roads running through them. So a typical day's hike would be a van drive to the trailhead from either a local hotel or, or on one of our transfer days. And then we'd start up and typically we'd hike up, up a slope or up through a valley to approach a volcano and then hike up to the rim and walk along it. Other days we hiked through, we had some pond hikes, so we just went from lake to lake up through plateaus and valleys and looping through the fall colors, which was really quite gorgeous. Typically we'd have a lunch stop during the day sometime on the trail. And then some of the volcanic landscapes you can see in the pictures of Hokkaido, we would walk along the edge. You don't typically walk right through the active volcano, of course, but you get very close good views along the edges of these steaming cauldrons, and it's, it's quite spectacular. And if you're able to see the lava in any of them? No, no. There's no lava flowing, not like on, see on Hawaii. All you really see are hot springs, like you might see at Yellowstone, and a lot of steam vents. But producing great amounts of steam in some cases. The one that reminded me of the Tangerero Crossing, I'm going to ask Rick to say it because he's better with these words. The Daisette Susan National Park Traverse we did runs from one edge of the park to the other at a pretty high elevation, like six, 7,000 feet. And so it's above the tree line in places and has a lot of that volcanic landscape we were talking about. It was also very beautiful. That's where we saw many, many different colors of the rock and of the foliage, too. You Actually, that was, according to my notes here, that was the second park that you went to. The first one, and I'm going to butcher these names, the Shikotsutoya National Park. Is that the one that has all the wildlife or did or any of the parks? Did, were you able to see any of the wildlife? We saw deer on a regular basis and on many of the hikes. One of the interesting things, though, yeah, we saw a fox. We had a red fox kind of on by Setsu's on. We saw him twice. <laughs> and uh, But it's funny, I had never thought about bears in Japan, but the northern island of Hokkaido has brown bears, which are related to the Kodiak bears in Alaska. And so they're one of the largest bear species, and they're pretty unpredictable like grizzlies or, or brown bears. So several national parks, you have to go through an orientation our guides carried bear spray like you would in some of the parks in our country. And we just had to kind of keep an eye out. And it would have been just wonderful to see one from a distance, but we never had that opportunity. Oh, interesting. When I read about that, I wasn't thinking it was part of in the grizzly side. I was thinking more of the black bear kind, but huh, interesting. And I'll refer people to my companion podcast, the Adventure Travel Show podcast, where I did a show on bear safety. So whenever you're hiking in bear country, you know what to do, depending on what the species are. So I'll put links to that in the show notes. So then also one thing they're known for over there are the wildflowers. I know you were there in the fall time. Were you able to see any then or is that more a springtime thing or can you address that a little bit? We did have some like late blooming flowers. I wouldn't say a lot. Uh, We were probably more impressed with the fall color of the leaves turning. So there were just a few flowers out and we didn't really weren't able to identify them. Yeah. So that's one thing you miss going into fall. You have trade off of flowers versus fall colors. That area is known, according to my research, for the wildflowers. So that gives you a choice depending on what you're more interested in seeing, depending on which time of year you'd like to go into. You also were on some cable cars and things like that, and they have a funny name for them. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, the ropeways. Oh, the term ropeways is kind of, uh, to us, an antiquated term, but it just mainly means the cable cars that run. Uh, they're just like the ones you see in Europe. There are what we'd call maybe gondolas that carry quite a few people in a compartment at one time up to the higher elevations of these parks. And one of our hikes involved a gondola followed by an open air chairlift to get up to our actual trailhead where we did a traverse across Iset Susan National Park. And then finally, it was a gondola at the other end to come all the way right down to our village that we were staying at. So we had a beautiful van shuttle in the morning. We got to drop right at our hotel in the late afternoon. Nice, nice. And so these cable cars or the ropeways are actually getting you through the elevation and the decline so that you're mainly up on, on the ridge top. Is that what they're doing? or Right. It gets you up higher, at least. Uh, from the, the actual start of our trail, we did still have about 1,200 feet of vertical climb immediately after that. And then uh, from then on, it was big rolling hills. Even though we got a big help from the gondolas, we still had several thousand feet of elevation during the day, but it would have been more like 5,000 feet had we not been assisted by the cable cars. It was a great time and knee saver, I guess. Yeah, that sounds like that was well worth it. Yeah, because you still get the nice challenging hike, but you're not killing yourself. Right. What were some of your favorite things that you saw there? 
I think just the raw volcanic landscape was so impressive to be walking along the rim of these volcanoes that were it just, there was always reminders that they were very active. Some of the steam vents are silent, but some were just roaring like an absolute jet engine. You could look down into the volcano and it reminded me of what Mount St. Helens would have been like had you been there the day after the eruption. It's pretty, pretty quiet now, but right after the eruption, of course, it was a lot more activity going along. And uh, it's just kind of stunning to see it uh, and with the colors and the steam and the noise it makes. It's quite impressive. Unfortunately, you have to sometimes do a little bit of stink, too. There's a fair amount of sulfur in the air, depending on whether you're downwind or not. You have to deal with a little bit of that on the hikes, but it was not overwhelming. I recall one of my volcanoes that I went to in Nicaragua, there was one because of the smell, I think, or whatever it was, they would only allow us to be up there for 15 minutes. Did you come across anything like that at all? No, we never had any warnings, but on one of our hikes where we completely looped the rim of one of the volcanoes, when we were on the downhill or downwind leg of it, yeah, it was pretty smelly. And I think we probably spent about 15 or 20 minutes in that, and that was plenty for me. One thing about each of these volcanoes was that it was very windy when we were at the top. So that helped, I think, with the odor. At least in my experience, it's only when you're right up at the rim. When you're down a little bit away from that, it wasn't stinky at all. Is that what you experienced? That's pretty much true, yeah. The crater emits all the sulfur and it makes its way up to the rim and then it dissipates out in the atmosphere. So you don't, once you're away from the rim, you don't tend to smell it at all. Let's switch gears here. I saw something else about at the Akan, Akan National Park. How do you pronounce that? Akan. Akan. Okay, I wasn't even close. All right, at Akan National Park, they had some unusual balls of uh, some marine algae. What's that? What are they talking about there? We didn't actually get a chance to see those. They tend to drift in and out with currents and things. It's likely the algae is a function of what the chemicals that are released into the lake from the volcanic areas, the hot springs. It just it's really tends to promote algae growth and it could clump into little balls. And uh, we did get to go through a great set of hot springs and right on the shore of Lake Akan, we didn't actually see any algae floating out on the lake itself. So it's not something bioluminescent, it's just some unusual clumps of algae? Is it something attractive to look at? Because they have it in the write-up, so I thought it would be something cool. Yeah, it's, I think it's hit and miss as to whether you see them. It's not a guaranteed uh, site. <laughs> okay. And now with all the mud pots and the thermal springs, are you able to actually use any of those for your leisure or things just to look at and don't touch? No, they're more like you would see in a national park where they're sort of roped off. There's a boardwalk around them. And you're not allowed to touch those, but the source of those hot springs and pots is tapped into for all of the onsens that we stayed at. So we're indirectly using the water, but just not out in uh, taking mud baths in nature. <laughs> gotcha. And of all the parks, which was your favorite? I think Daisetsuzan. Just that day we did the long traverse was really just one of the most spectacular hikes I've done. We had good weather. And this is a case where our guide, John, who has had a lot of experience over there, he actually, you'll see the schedule, you know, online of what hiking days come first and second, he actually flipped two around to take advantage of a weather forecast that called for misty weather. And we did a lake hike that day where we had low cloud cover, but it didn't matter. And the next day, we were able to go up high when the sun broke out and had these great clear views. And not all guides would have done that. It, we were just involved some extra driving and some rearranging, but he managed that for us to, to get us the most possible enjoyment, I think. Oh, that's great, too. I think there's an advantage, too, of going with a small group rather than a large one because they would never be able to change all everything like that for that many people. And talking about the lakes, they say that the Caldera Lake of Mashuko, Mash, how do you say that, is considered by many to be the most beautiful in Japan. Can you talk about that? John told us that he thought it was very similar to the crater lake we have here in Oregon. I didn't think it was quite that spectacular. <laughs> But perhaps that's being a little uh, provincial on my part. It was quite lovely. The colors were good. And one of the most special parts of hiking around that was that our guide, Tom, actually stopped and told us the story. It has a Native people's story that we often have here in the Northwest with the Native American. But he sang then the song of the story. He said, most of the people in Japan don't know this story about this lake. But then the, a song became popular about 20 years ago. And he said, now everyone knows it. 
And he stood there with the wind blowing and our view of the lake with its little island in the middle of it, singing this song to us. And it was quite, quite lovely. Apparently, all the peoples were killed except for a grandmother and a grandson in this tale. And they come to this lake area to survive. So <laughs> that was very, very nice. That's cool. That's cool. I love all that. Yeah, in fact, speaking of the original or the native peoples, the indigenous Ainu called this area the Sirtak, meaning end of the earth. Can you talk a little bit about the original peoples and why they might call it the end of the earth? Uh, well, yes. I'm trying to think what I remember because there was one group of people that we heard about continually, and it begins with an A. I, I think Ainu. Yes, yes. Ainu. And there are still some Ainu around, but we saw a museum of the northern peoples, which we really enjoyed. And that talked about all northern peoples, not just Japanese northern people, but people on the same latitude mm -hmm. around the world. So we had some United States people, some Russian people, Cossacks, I think. And that was really quite a lovely museum, well worth visiting. I could have spent more time there. And where was that? It was in the town of Abashiri. Abashiri, the town of Abashiri, the Museum of the Northern Peoples. Okay, good. I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. That's, that kind of stuff fascinates me to no end. What are some of your favorite memories of your trip? I honestly think that the hiking and the views on our hiking were my favorite parts of the trip. They were just spectacular. As Rick nicely pointed out, these were harder hikes than they, you thought they might be based on what reading the mileage and the elevation, but they were all spectacular. And I have to say, the food was really something memorable also. The people were all more very warm and friendly, but on Hokkaido, I think there were less Japanese people speaking English than I expected. They seemed to understand better than they spoke it, but I was a little surprised. You know, we can be a little egocentric about thinking the world all speaks English, particularly in touristy spots. But when we were out hiking, it didn't feel touristy to me. We seldom saw other European-looking people or American-looking people. As I said, it was not crowded, but there were more Japanese people out hiking. And that was nice, too, actually. Everybody was friendly. Everybody was curious. And it was just, just lovely. Oh, one unique thing. This isn't one of my favorite things, but, but worked for us. We actually got most of our lunches at 7-Elevens. The 7-Elevens in Japan, or at least on Hokkaido, are quite different than the ones here in town. And they always had lunch food. Some were sandwiches, but very often they were triangular or circle rice dishes with something in the middle, which could be shrimp or pork or something else. And John said, our guide, that he particularly liked that because if it was windy when it was time to eat or people needed a snack, they could just unroll it and eat while they were hiking. It was nutritious and healthy. And like I said, those of us who know 7-Eleven here in the United States would not necessarily think of that as a healthy lunch alternative. But we also have some friends who did uh, one of the temple walks, and they also got their lunches that way. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a common thing to do there, but not something that we knew in advance. Interesting. And Richard, what were some of your favorite memories? Well, I hate to say I traveled to Japan just for the food, but we did find the buffets were really a great way to go. That's just the way that most of the hotels worked. And it gave you a chance to sample a lot of different varieties of foods, not all of which I put on my favorites list, like some of the seafood that had tentacles that were still squirming, which probably things I wouldn't eat over here. But <laughs> it was sort of a little bit of adventure. Aside from the food, it was just the hiking scenery, the challenge of the trails was really fun. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. We took a nice, slow, easy pace, got a chance to look around a lot at the views, so we were never rushed. So that just made it really enjoyable. Was it the right mix of hiking each day? Did you feel like, oh, you had a good day's hike, or were some days like, oh my God, is this day ever going to end? Or how did you feel about that when you mentioned the pace? No, it was good. One of our longest days, again, was the Daisetsuzan Traverse, and it, w it took uh, quite a while and hours, but... We were always just had great views to stop and look at. And we again, lots of breaks, lots of ways to break it up. 
That one got a little windy too. We pretty much had on every layer of clothing we needed <laughs> for the trip. And you know, we survived just fine, but we did kind of rush through a couple spots where the wind was the strongest and then sort of relax a little bit more where it was calm. Elevation wise, how high are we talking on average, would you say? Well, I think the highest hikes were around 7,000, but some of them were only three or 4,000 feet. So say three to seven, most they stayed in that range. Okay, good. So you're not worrying necessarily about, ele- like I have elevation issues. I start feeling around 8,000, so I would have no problem with this hike. No, I shouldn't. Yeah, that sounds great. Is there anything I should have asked you about this hiking holiday that I did not? I think that they just did a really nice job of sampling the national parks. That's one of the things I like about tours like this is that you get to try each of the main national parks. Each has its own unique thing to offer. Two of them had bears various kind of sanctuaries and we had to go through lectures. And actually one of the funniest stories is that last national park we went through, we did a nature loop and you're required to go through an orientation with a ranger. So you get a room full of people and a ranger comes out in the same kind of hat they wear here at United States National Parks, the big flat brimmed hats. And he dresses the crowd in Japanese. He was sort of the warm up guy, I think. And he told a lot of stories and everyone was laughing and but we couldn't understand a word of it. So we assumed he was saying, we're going to feed the American tourists in the back row to the bears and then you'll be safe. <laughs> <laughs> but we never quite. But then the actual orientation video is subtitled in English. And that's the important part we got to take from take away from it. So okay, now as you're saying that, it's like you have to go to an orientation in Japanese and you can't understand a word they're saying. All right, so good. They had that figured out. We also enjoyed, we went there two days early or a day and a half early to see Sapporo. And it's not necessarily a city taking advantage of itself for tourism, but we found it to be quite lovely. Was We found a uh, Ferris wheel on top of one of the tallest buildings and so took a Ferris wheel ride, which gave you really wonderful views of all the areas surrounding Sapporo. You may remember that the Winter Olympics was outside of that town a few years ago. And when you read the average temperatures, I wish I had reviewed this before we talked, but it seems to me the average high for that time is 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And it wasn't that warm most of the day. So we went through a cooler stretch, but I think it's well worth spending at least a day in Sapporo. We happened to get there when there was a fair going on. They have a big park block area, which is long and linear And it was full of vendors for a fall festival. And so every regional area of Hokkaido had a a booth. And so you got fish from the area where they had fish and deeper sea food from area where their product was deeper sea food. And that was quite interesting. And then they also plan an Oktoberfest, which looked like Germany's Oktoberfest, So we only saw signs of that, but thought that was an interesting aspect. Very cool. Very cool. So now you have been all over the world and have done so many amazing adventures. How does this experience rate compared to some of those? Somehow saying we've been all over the world sounds like more than we've done to me, but we have had a chance to experience a lot of the world. And, you know, it's, I always find it difficult to compare. I thought this was uniquely beautiful. You know, we didn't bicycle, it's hiking every day, but it was lovely hiking. I think it would be up there pretty darn high. Yeah, one of the things that attracted me to Japan, not just the culture, but the fact that while we enjoyed South America immensely, it was interesting that everyone on our trip got sick at some point or another in in Peru or Bolivia. And in Japan, everyone was very healthy. So I think it's a very clean, very tidy healthy kind of place to travel in with a lot less to worry about than sort of used to traveling in the United States where you feel safe. You'll probably feel very safe in Japan as well. And their culture is just so different than ours too, that I just find that very appealing. And I also like the fact that this does not seem over tourist, which is becoming a bigger and bigger bee in my bonnet, the more I'm traveling because everything is getting so crowded, but this doesn't sound like that at all. So it sounds like a really wonderful experience. Absolutely. Yeah. We never found the trails crowded. We always saw people, but we never had big lines to go through. We never had to wait. We always had parking available. The onsens were easy to get into. Some of the hotels we stayed at were quite large. Like Sue was saying, eight stories tall. 
And you'd think, how can they possibly get all these people into baths? But everyone sort of takes their own time. You know, we found it to be actually quite quiet and peaceful inside the baths. Very nice. Any final thoughts? Just if you're traveling from the West Coast, one thing to consider is that there are direct flights to Tokyo now. They're pretty common. And it's, well, it's a long time to stay on one plane. It gets you there a lot faster and you just sort of get it over with. We enjoyed a Portland to Tokyo flight. So if you're booking, that's one thing to consider. Less chance of losing your luggage and transfers. So, but yeah, I'd encourage people to visit Japan anywhere and Hokkaido specifically, if you're looking for that hiking experience, that's a little off the beaten path. Perfect. Susan, any final thoughts? This is not directly related to the hiking adventure, but I did notice something that I thought was significant. In the United States, you always run into waste paper baskets or trash cans and they're full and things are overflowing and falling down on the ground around them. Here, they don't use as much paper. You don't get a paper napkin unless you really search for it. There are no paper towels in the restrooms and yet you get your hands dry just perfectly fine using their dryers. Um, We actually had to look for trash cans sometimes and they often had, like at the festival that we were at, they had people who were taking the recycling from you and sorting it into bins right there. So it was that was part of the cleanliness of the society, I think. Well, I appreciate you all coming on the show again, and we love having you back. And as you do further adventures, please be sure to let us know so we can get you back on because we love having you. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed today's show about the North Islands of Japan. Remember, you'll get the free travel planner that goes with this episode, as well as access to all previous travel planners If you sign up for my once a month, and remember it's just once a month, no spam guarantee, unsubscribe anytime guarantee newsletter, I send out, I try to get it out the first or the second Thursday of each month that has some background on the previous month, plus your access to the travel planners and any other fun things that I might find. Hit me up at activetraveladventures.com, hit the contact button. There's a newsletter button. You can always write me at kit at activetraveladventures.com and just ask me and I'll put you on the list that way. Please do make sure that you are getting this monthly newsletter. And one of the things I like most about the newsletter is it's a great way for us to have a two-way conversation. Get reply, it comes right to my inbox, and we have a little chit-chat going back and forth. And I'll try to answer any questions I can and help out any way I can. Again, thank you so much for listening. Until next time, this is Kit Parks at Venture On. Adventure On.